Can you hear me? Okay. Alex, thank you for that introduction. Um, really interesting point that Kristen made about people. This conference is about technology. We're hearing about everything from blockchain to artificial intelligence, machine learning. But at the end of the day, behind that tech is human beings. Now, how do we help those people, if you're a manager, if you're a company founder, become the best at what they do, create those products and services? Well, who better to discuss that than the CEO of Manpower Group, Jonas Prising, and chief, his chief talent scientist, Tomas Shemero Premizik. I'd like to invite them to the stage. Thank you both. Thank you, Parmi. All right. Um, OK, so much to cover here. This is such an important topic, because I think people can be lost in the conversation when we talk about technology. We get a bit too caught up in the theory and the gadgets and the electronics. Um, Jonas, let's start with you. When we talk about skills and upskilling people, what are the skills that people are going to need in a future where artificial intelligence has just decimated so many of the jobs that are available today? I'm talking five, 10 years out. So we, we, well, we might talk about it later in that you know, we don't really believe that it's going to destroy that many jobs. It's going to change the tasks within the jobs, but leave that for, for a later discussion maybe. Um, we still think that hard skills are going to be important because if you want to be creative, you have to build the creativity on the base of knowledge that you, you have. So you can't outsource creativity. So hard skills are still going to be important. Maybe more you know, with, with a science and STEM bent, but at the same time, creativity, communication, collaboration are still going to be you know, extremely important uh, capabilities to have. And can I just stop to kind of clarify the conversation for everyone? Can you define the difference between hard skills and soft skills? What does that mean exactly? So hard skills is, is, a, is a clear knowledge about a topic that, that you have. Soft skills are things that you exhibit and that you, that you can train that helps you interact with other people and or create and have ideas and innovation and things like that. So you wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't have a hard skill topic that's called innovation, but you can learn about innovation and you can... Uh, you can apply that. So we think hard skills and soft skills are going to be important. Maybe some of the hard skills are going to shift because knowledge is ubiquitously available to anybody at a moment's notice. But we think that the key evolution that's going to happen in this industrial revolution or the fourth industrial revolution is this notion of learnability, the desire and ability to keep on learning. And, and it's a very different kind of learning than what we've seen in the past. So learn to learn is going to be the, the evolution and the skill set that, that individuals will have to acquire to be you know, having a great, employable, uh, and a great employability during the course of their careers. And do you think that's a difficult concept to get across to people? Because with the advent of Google, we've almost become a little bit lazy. You don't really need to learn all, the, all 50 United States or European nations or anything like that, because it's all there on the internet, so long as you have a Wi-Fi connection, which you don't always hear, but anyway. Yeah, no, I think, I think actually it is a very difficult concept because, you know, people, you know, at least in our traditional educational, you know, system, you know, once you graduate, you're done. Yeah. So this is, the, the outcome is to have acquired the hard skills and hopefully some soft skills as right. well, and then you're done. This is the outcome. So the idea that the outcome has to be hard skills, soft skills, and the ability to learn to learn, is a big change. And we know, and many of you here in the audience know, when you put educational materials or online learning available for all of the members of the organization, the take-up rate is actually quite low. So we don't have, in many cases, I believe, you know, th this natural desire to learn you know, with everybody at the scale that's going to be needed. You can't just throw a book at people and say, oh, that's how you're going to learn. Okay, let's bring this over to uh, Tomas, because one thing I wanted to say before you speak is that you were brought on board at Manpower Group to, to help the company get better at learning how to measure those soft skills, right? Yes, exactly. And I think, you know, as you said in the introduction, uh, it's easy to forget in a world so obsessed with technology that it's still about people. So long as people are at work, uh, we need to understand them. And in the last 10 years, we have seen unprecedented um, technological innovations help us scale uh, you know, our understanding of people. So you know, imagine for 
most people, they have maybe very good knowledge of the people they work with every day, the people who are their best friends, maybe their spouses, uh, hopefully their spouses. Um, imagine that you can today use data technology assessment in a way that enables you to have that level of understanding or even better of people who you never interacted with in your life. And that knowledge is demonstrated by predicting performance. If you can predict what people do, then you can surely claim that you understand them. If you can't predict what p others do, then you don't understand them well. Okay, so let me give an example of that. If I can just throw this out there. I mean, are we talking you know, facial recognition in the office where you can see whether people are smiling and happy and productive or, because this is actually, I, I recently read a report, this is happening in China, like classrooms to measure the performance of the teacher, check that the kids are actually taking things in. I mean, is that what you're, you're talking about here? Well, you know, and I, I don't think that it's only in China. I think, you know, there are organizations piloting different technologies internally. The first thing to state is that everything can and should be done in an ethical way, okay? So I think, uh, and the number one way to ensure that is to give information back to people. If I'm observing what my employees do or what, um, you know, potential employees or candidates do via these new technologies, which can be, um, you know, wearables or speech, voice, video recognition, and I gather impressions of them, they would benefit from knowing what that tells them about them. So, so hey, this is you about have... Don't keep it to yourself. Exactly. Exactly. Don't keep it private. Share it with the employee. Absolutely. Okay. Because fundamentally, you know, the perceived uh, asymmetry or the perceived deal that if the organization um, reveals what, it's no what it knows about the employee, the employee kind of wins and it doesn't work or vice versa, it's not true. Both parties benefit from mutual understanding. Organizations benefit if they understand employees better, and employees benefit if they're better understood and if they understand themselves better, because today they, they have a very rudimentary understanding of what their potential actually is. So um, just keeping it with you for a, and one other question, and Tomas, on this point of soft skills. You come from an academic background. Um, you, was, it, was it UCL, did you say? Or? Yes, and Columbia. In, in London, and uh, so you, you really understand how to measure behavioral science. I mean, how do employers do that now? What are the metrics they need to be looking at? I think mostly employers and organizations overcomplicate things because really when we think about employability or the main soft skills that predict whether somebody can do a job well or not, there are only three main attributes that count, ability, likability, and drive. So ability used to be more about hard skills, now it's increasingly also about soft skills like general intelligence, the ability to adapt, and learnability, which we think is going to become really, really important in the next few years. Likeability is being rewarding to deal with. Do you have people skills? Do others enjoy interacting with you or not? And drive is motivation. If you break it down into those three buckets, it's not difficult to assess those things. But I would say that's really difficult. How on earth do you even begin to measure that? Well, you know, likeability can be evaluated pretty well through peer reviews or other ratings. That's if true. other people think you're likable, nice, charismatic, they're probably 360 right. 360 reviews. <laughs> yeah, I mean, self, self views are very inaccurate. Most people think they are more likable than they actually are. Most people think they're funnier than they are. Most people think they're more creative than they are. But so feedback is very important. And then hard work, motivation, work ethic, or the willingness to uh, learn, you can assess that via psychometric tests. You can get objective markers, what people actually do, who they relate to, how they email, how often, who, etc. So we have now a surplus of data to make sense of these soft skills. There is no excuse for playing it by ear. Okay. Um, Jonas, these kinds of things, which I presume are being enabled by software, right? These are old kind of tests. They've been around for a long time, but suddenly we have networks, we have phones, we have Fitbits. Um, we have facial recognition where we can actually start to take that data and process it. What do leaders have to do, you know, if you're a manager, to prevent that sense among, among a workforce that they are being spied on, essentially? I mean, this was the cover. I mean, the Economist had this on the cover a couple of weeks ago. I mean, they're a competitor of ours, but I'll say it anyway. And it was a great story about this actually being a bit of a problem. I, and, and we do believe that, you know, as part of great leadership, if you think about leadership in general, it's about being capable, it's about having a bias for action, 
but it's about having you know a, a very clear and and strong moral compass with ethical values and being altruistic so you know putting others before self if you're you're if you're not paying attention to those last last two aspects it could become a very big issue so i think it is a a very dicey navigation that we are w walking towards and i think you see some of the you know the challenges within the area of data and how different parts of the world are thinking about it differently. So GDPR, so the protection yeah. of personal data here in Europe, is you know this month becoming you know the law of the land with very heavy sanctions. And we think that eventually the same kinds of rules will apply to the use of data because we will have almost unlimited amounts of data about what people do where they are, whether they talk to a lot of people, whether they spend a lot of time working, whether they're you know, effective you know, remotely. Because a lot of organizations today have a very tough time defining productivity of employees in most positions. There are some positions that are very easy to define, but a lot of positions are very hard to define. And can I give you an example of that? I recently interviewed a startup in London which was selling software to employers to measure how many emails each of their staff was sending every day. And they had like this kind of chart where they could see, oh, Bob is doing really well. He sent 20 emails yesterday before 10 a.m. But it's, is that really a good metric to measure productivity? And, and as you say, like there are so many different ways. Yeah, and I think that's exactly what we're seeing in some of these startups. The idea that some of these metrics are good predictors of future performance is erroneous. So this, this difference between correlation and casualty and you know, what is really important and what do we want to achieve, I think has a lot of different um, indicators that may not at all have anything to do with eventual performance. And you know, I, I know from talking a lot to Tomas that a lot of the things that are happening today that are pretending to be predictable and data-based in actual fact have a very low degree of scientific validity. So it's fun, it's entertaining, but it may not actually be predicting any improvement in performance and or likelihood to be better at, at one's job. Exactly, and it is cool to be able to look at the numbers and feel that sense of validation. Oh, I've, got, I've got, really got the metrics down pat. How do you, as an employer, know that actually none of this is that useful or valid from a scientific point of view, as you say? So, you know, the, the good news is that the mechanisms and the processes for testing whether something works, whether it has ROI, uh, have been in place for a long time, okay? So, uh, to use the example that you gave, uh, it might be that the quantity and variety of emails that people send on an average day is indicative of their drive, engagement, ambition, but there's a way to find out. Let's track those people, see whether they stay longer, see whether they are rated more favorably on 360s, see whether they meet or exceed their KPIs, and let's also use theory. There are scientific and theoretical reasons to actually suspect that there is a connection between that activity at work and these underlying facets of potential. You know? And I'll give you another really good example that highlights how you can use some of these technological advances for ethical or at least progressive liberal means. Um, the uh, researchers at MIT use sociometric badges to literally tag employees for four or five weeks. And they measured everything they said, did for four or five weeks. It feels very intrusive, of course to identify whether men and women were treated in the same way at work. And what they found is that from a data analytics perspective, men and women were identical. They were doing exactly the same thing. They were speaking as much in meetings. They were interacting as much with people from the same and wow. other gender. And yet, the data doesn't lie, on eh? average, and yet on average, they got promoted 25% as often as men. So imagine how else would you actually demonstrate that there is bias if you don't have all this data. If you don't have it, we rely on these kind of uh, inferences, guesses or stereotypes. Oh, maybe they're not leaning in. Maybe they're not bold. But we can actually use data to answer that question. Right, and sorry, just to clarify, did you say the women were promoted 25% less? less? Okay, exactly. got it. Less. Um, so Jonas, it sounds like with all of this, Am I right in saying as a takeaway, if anyone has, is an employer here, runs a company, if they want to upskill their, their workforce, measure more, but 
disclose to your employees what you're collecting about them, basically? Or is there more to it? Yeah, no, I think that would, that would be definitely a very clear direction to take. We will have to treat this data with you know, the responsibility that we treat all other data. And in many cases, this is more sensitive data because we may be uncovering things that are not even known to the individual. So to Tomas's point, a great way of having development and learning conversations with the people so that they themselves have this desire to improve themselves and to learn from what, what the situation is. Let's talk about that point, actually. Um, you mentioned learning and, and kind of improving themselves. And this is something that everybody has to have in mind in an age where technology is moving so quickly. Um, are my skills still going to be relevant as they are in five, ten years' time? Um, you know, when people talk about the gig economy, there's a lot of sense that actually you're in this game on your own. But how much do employers still need to step in and actually help people retrain themselves? Should employers be providing programs, or is that something that people just need to do on their own? We definitely believe that the ability to upskill and reskill your workforce is going to be a core capability of any organization for a number of reasons. You mentioned one of them, which is the very rapid uh, evolution of technology, which requires new skills to take advantage of those technologies. Uh, there are demographic reasons. You know, most of the populations in the developed world are stagnating and or shrinking. So the talent pools are getting, are getting smaller. And you know, the technology moves so quickly that you will want to make sure that you move your workforce population along with the changes while you still have time to make the, the transition. Otherwise, you end up in a situation where you analyze your workforce and you'll say, well, 30% of them don't, you know, will no longer be part of the plans for the next five years because they, th their starting level is too low. So whenever you're in a situation like that, it's a crisis because the likelihood to make a successful company transformation while, while changing out 30 or, or, or massive amounts of your workforce are extremely low and it's very, very high risk. So it is essentially going to be a driving force to run a better business, to continue to educate and to enable individuals to learn while they are there. We also think it's one of the reasons you'll choose to work for companies. Because the employment contract in terms of jobs for life, that promise is out. Most individuals coming into the workforce today, they know this is not going to be the case, that it's not realistic. So your employer branding and your employer promise has to be something else. And if it is that you can come and work with my organization, our organization and our team, and you know, we don't know for how long, but we can promise you this, when you leave, you will be more marketable in terms of your skills, so it'll be easier for you to find a different position within our organization or outside the organization. That's a very interesting way of pitching to a new employee, come and join us so that you can leave us even better in five years' time, basically, would you say? Well, I think the idea that as an organization, your workforce and anybody that joins you is joining a closed system is an outdated view. It's an open market. So whether you like it or not, you, know, you are competing on the open market even with all of your employees that are in the organization. And especially, you know, those that have the skills that are highly attractive on the, on the market, they're highly mobile. They will move if they don't feel that they can progress. Yeah, yeah and I was going to say, this is a quote that has been attributed to many people, Warren Buffett, Henry Ford, but, you know, Jonas now as well. <laughs> uh, the only thing worse than training your people to see them leave is not training them and have them stay, right? So yeah. you can't gamble. There is no option. You have to, you have you, to make... Then you just stagnate, right? Exactly. But, um, Presumably, that means that the employers of today need to do a better job and spend more money training their employees than their forebears of 10 years ago. I mean, it's, it's not just a matter of continuing, but actually doing more. Yeah, and I think if you look at the comments from uh, the participants at Tech for Good, and we were, we, were the, we were represented there as well, you know, you can see all of the companies talking about how many people they are committed to reskilling and upskilling in their organization and outside of their organization. Just as we at Manpower Group here in France at this conference, we're launching, you know, the, the ability for online courses for digital skills for 360,000 of our temporary employees. So companies are doing this today, so it's no longer anecdotal, it's no longer a wish, but of course it's not enough just to have the larger organization doing it, it has to be more ubiquitous, and that's much harder for smaller and medium-sized organizations to, to afford. Uh, the technology helps because it's not as expensive, 
uh, but I think that that's where the shift comes in terms of the protection and the, the move in the support systems. And I think France, for instance, is making some very bold moves from job security and providing employment security. So now every individual has his or her own training portfolio in terms of a fund that they can deploy to buy training. And that's a highly innovative idea, leveraging the social support network and system that exists in France, but applying it to a digital world. So it becomes forward-looking as opposed to you know, rearward-looking. And that's a, that's a great innovation to see here in the, in the French market. Yeah. And of course, that's state-provided, right? This is a, one of Macron's reforms. Um, did you have anything to say on that, Tomas? It looked Not like on that, it's a to... brilliant answer. <laughs> I was going to ask if you can kind of, can you bring it down to earth with some examples? Um, you talked about technology being used to retrain people. Um, what are some ways that employers can do this? I mean, when you imagine what that really means in practice, is it just taking people in on a retreat two days on a conference? Um, do someone with a flip chart, couple of, couple of hours, or what does it really mean? What's the best way to actually train your employees? Well, I think the, the, the idea and the interesting evolution is this insta intersection between human and technology. So if you go to our booth, you know, a little bit down the hall, you'll see how we're using virtual reality to train our associates that are going to be working on a construction site or in a food preparation site. You will see us using augmented reality in terms of understanding how you stack shelves in the right way or what kind of safety equipment is used for what purpose. So it is doing what we used to do before, but in a completely different and a more engaging way. And I think that's really the evolution that, that you're seeing. So it's not that we're going from you know, one, one activity to a completely different activity. We're augmenting.